Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you all here this morning. Uh, we're going to continue the study on Judges chapter 16. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful, Lord, for the opportunities that we have to study together, that we can come together in the morning, and that we can look at your word, and that we can be encouraged and inspired. Uh, we are thankful, Lord, for what you are doing in our lives and the lives of those around us. Uh, we're grateful for the work that you can do upon the human heart as your word enters into us and affects this powerful change, this recreation of the image of Christ in us. And so we just ask, Lord, that you can continue this work, that we can partake of your word, and that the blessings that we receive, that we can share those with others. May your Holy Spirit be here now as we study together. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, there's a lot of things that uh, are coming together as we look at Judges chapter 16. So, um, so just a really brief summary. We know that as we've looked at the book of Judges, that it covers the period of time from 9-11 uh, to 2023, to the time that we're in. It does reflect and give us a date in the future, a symbolic date, April 5th, 2030. Whatever that means, we don't know, other than that uh, we've been able to connect that to this whole history. And, and one of the ways that we did that was um, looking from the first day of the first month when the Israelites were first given the calendar. And I'll go to this other diagram. I just kind of completed this a little bit. Um, Got this doubled here because I was going to use this for something, so I'll just get rid of this. And um, when we go back to 1533 BC, from the first day of the first month, and we count April 5th, 2030, the first day of the first month, it's a period of 3,562 years, half of which, so if we take this number and we divide it into half, we get this 1781. And of course, if we do this forward in reverse, uh, we get 178 and 187. And those together equal 365. 187 is the number of days from the spring to the autumnal equinox. And 178 is from uh, the autumnal equinox to the spring equinox. The number of days is 1,301,000 days. The number 1301 is the 112th prime number. If we put that on the Mayan long count calendar, uh, 130100 is the second month, the 12th day. So that relates to the prime, which also relates to February 12th, 2022. And, um, and this is the second month, 12th day in... Um, the Islamic calendar, and I believe the year was 2013. And yes, so the number 365.25, notice these are the same numbers in the length of a year, just these two are reversed, and, uh, and then you would actually have another five at the end, right? So, but it has those same numbers, so it's just an iteration of those numbers of the length of the year. And then, um, uh, so this we had put uh, in connection with Judges chapter 15. And Judges chapter 15, um, one of the things we had done is we had taken this story. So the first part of Judges 15, we put really connected to chapter 14. Um, but this part of Judges 15, verses 7 to 20, uh, we've marked uh, these different uh, verses. So 15 verse 7, that gives you the 7, 1820, July 18, 2020. And um, then we have these marking these dates, these spans of time, the 777 structure. 
we have this seven uh, weeks, seven times seven, between Colin's presentation on December 25th, 21, and the 12th day of the second month in 2022, which is Odilio's presentation. And we had also noticed that this was the first fruit offerings, and uh, we have the two loaves uh, that are here in the wheat harvest, uh, pardon me, two loaves here at Pentecost. And then we take this story um, from uh, Judges 15, this first part. So this is kind of connecting Judges, the first part of Judges 15 with chapter 14, but the 300 foxes, that story, the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month comes from the story of Ezra. And so we have these um, two end periods. So these are the presentations of Colin and Odilio. We have the anniversary of that. And then we also have the end of, um, of uh, Colin's prediction. And that's going to connect us to this wheat harvest here. So these are actually tied together here. So this is like an anniversary of, of these. So when we go to uh, this section, and uh, we now have, again, this being marked in, in this line at the late, latter part of Judges chapter 15. Now, when we look at Judges 16, what, we're, what we see is that we have 16 verse 1. And that 16 verse 1 relates to the 16th day of the first month, which is the wave offering. And this is all um, coming together as I put together a paper on the wave offering. So sometimes called the wave sheaf offering. Um, and... Uh, that that offering is 49 or 50 days, depending how you count, to Pentecost. So this first part here of Judges 16 is going to relate to um, this um, wave offering, which in some ways we tie more to Collins' uh, first fruits rather than to Odilio's. But Adilio's ends up being the second. So we have the two loaves, the 1843, the 1850 chart, uh, which are prominent in Odilio's study. So the charts are a part of his study. And we, in understanding the lines, we've taken this idea that as we zoom into a way mark, um, that we create these new reform lines. And We've taken the position that if we look at Millerite history, the thing that we have that parallels our history is Samuel Snow's letters. And so Samuel Snow's letter, the last letter being, being published on uh, July 18th, his third letter, which is the Pentecost letter, the second letter, which is the Passover letter, and his first letter, which is published on the false Passover, as well as on February 22nd, and it's written February 16th. So all of these different dates in Samuel Snow's letters come to play in the history of um, both uh, the history in 457 and in our history. So when we deal with midnight, so we have this message of Samson. So this is where we were finishing off yesterday, that uh, the message of Samson, sunlight um he's going to be um he's going to awake at midnight and who else awakes at midnight the 10 virgins the 10 virgins right stephen's written a paper on the 10 virgins the parable of the 10 virgins so they they awake at midnight now, we believe, at least I believe, I hope, hopefully every, everybody else can see this as well, that when we're zooming in, um, when our line is zooming in, it's, it's zooming into an approach of midnight. Uh, July 18th is three days before midnight. 
Now we also have used our line to as a zoom in on 9-11, but I think primarily our line is talking about midnight and midnight is the Sunday law. That is, if we go to Millerite history and we take 9-11 as being um, uh, the first day of the first month in Millerite history, and then we have midnight being the fifth day of the fourth month, and we have the midnight cry, the empowerment of that message on August 15th, uh, the first day of the fifth month. And then we have um, the 10th day of the seventh month, we mark that as the Sunday law, right? So, so we look at Millerite history, we say the 10th day of the seventh month is the Sunday law. But we know that if we are going to take that line and we're going to place it in our history, um, there, are, there are different ways that we can place it. So we say that the Sunday law, why do we place the Sunday law separate from the close of probation? Why do, why do we do that? Because if we understand that Ellen White um, saw the Sunday law, then the loud cry, then the close of probation. So on her line, she has October 22nd, 1844. That's the arrival of the third angel. And then she's going to see the next on that line, the Sunday law, then the loud cry, and then the close of probation. Why do we place the Sunday law as the close of probation? Even though, like, who is it a close of probation for? Uh, Iran says it's progressive. Sunday law is progressive. And we agree with that. But isn't it a close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists? the Sunday law. Yes. Yep. So, so is it a different line when we place the close of probation at the Sunday law than when we place the close of probation as the general close of probation after the loud cry? The judgment starts at the house of the Lord. Okay. But, it, but when it comes to a line, aren't we even before we actually understood this, weren't we actually creating another line? Because remember, when we went through this, Jeff used to see, just like Ellen White did, that the midnight cry and the loud cry parallel each other. And that there was a close of probation after the loud cry. And that was just like the midnight cry. And, and so when he had the Sunday law, he had the Sunday law, the loud cry, the close of probation. And he took that parallel that Ellen White gave about the midnight cry. And, and he accepted that. He accepted that if we're going to parallel Millerite history, we're going to place our history on that line. Uh, we're, we're, going to, we're going to do it just like that. We're going to put the midnight cry and the loud cry together. But later on, we, we moved things around. And, and this caused people to leave the movement because people saw that in their minds that Jeff was departing from what the spirit of prophecy had said. And, and it sort of happened gradually in the movement. Um, but it, of course, happened after 9-11, because we had to figure out what 9-11 was. And in understanding 9-11, which was something that was unforeseen in, in a sense, in the spirit of prophecy, other than that it's part of a repeat of history. And Jeff understood this repeat of history, that the first and second angels' messages needed to be repeated prior to, um, you know, the close of probation, we'll put it that way. As, as we became came closer and closer to these events, and especially after 9-11 had passed, we now could take 9-11 and we could line it up with August 11th, 1840, which initially Jeff had lined up with 1989, August 11th, 1840. So now he could see that there was this parallel. And, and he began to zoom into these lines 
And instead of having a line that went 1989, the Sunday law, the close of probation, which, which in some ways paralleled Millerite history in, in that the first part would be the first angel's message and the second part would be the second angel's message. Um, he started to, to zoom in and, and recognize these, these details. So now we had a midnight cry that precedes the Sunday law and a loud cry still that follows it, which doesn't seem to agree with what Ellen White said. So how did we reconcile this initially? Anybody remember? How did Jeff initially, his first uh, initial application of, of seeing that the midnight cry precedes the Sunday law, how did he resolve this problem? How did he parallel it with Millerite history? Anybody know? We've gone through this before. Yeah, he's um, making the clues to probation at the Sunday law. Right, so he makes a close of probation at the Sunday Law, but initially the way that he addressed that was in Millerite history, they had a midnight cry prior to um, the first day of the first month in 1844. That is through 1843 into the beginning part of 1844, they believed that they were giving the midnight cry. But after the first disappointment, they then had the true midnight cry. And, and the way that Jeff initially tried to address this was to say, well, we're in a sense of um, repeating the midnight cry of the Millerites. So to put the Sunday law at October 22nd, 1844, was he was creating this new line within a line but he had no way to really address how he was doing this um, because this is um, they, they did have this idea of fractalization come later, but initially he didn't have that. It, it took a little while for this to happen because I believe I'm trying to remember exactly when different things happened, but when he first did this, and he later just abandoned that idea, but he was correct. He just didn't know how to fit it in. What he ended up doing is combining um, the two messages. So then he started talking about they would be combined. So he would have, um, he had to move his understanding of 9-11 as representing two different histories, August 11th, 1840, and the first day of the first month. I mean, it's, it's rather involved how he came to do that, because as we started to understand these different waymarks, he now had to place them. But we know we ended up in 2016 with the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month with the two midnight and midnight cries in the center there. And, and that, I think, is still our primary understanding of that line, that we have this doubling with the midnight and the midnight cry. They're both the same way, Mark, though they appear at two different times in Millerite history. And, and those events have to precede the Sunday law. But in doing so, isn't Jeff creating another line within a line? Isn't he zooming into um, the Sunday law way, Mark, with our line? Because Jeff wasn't initially doing this. He was just putting the repetition of the first and second angel's message prior to the Sunday law. But as we zoomed in, isn't he creating another line? That is, he's zooming into the Sunday law waymark and illustrating that our history, especially from 9-11, when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down, to the Sunday law, 
is just a reform line that exists within the Sunday law way mark that Ellen White saw. Is that what we understand? Anyone? Anyone not agree? Okay, so who said something? Yeah, I was just agreeing. You, you agree? Yes. Okay. So, and, and this is pretty profound because I don't know how many people in the movement understand it this way. Because uh, it's something that we found as we've gone through this um, understanding of the lines. So Ellen White's line still still stands, just as she saw it. But she also saw a repeat of history that needed to happen before uh, the Sunday Law, right? I mean, that's what this whole movement is about. Now, in that zoom in, so if we're saying that our line 1989 to the Sunday Law is really just a zoom into that Sunday Law waymark, can we see that what we're experiencing presently is a zoom into the midnight of that zoom in, right? So we have our history. We have this way mark that's before us called midnight. And can we see that what we've been experiencing is now a zoom into midnight itself? Is that clear or is it not clear? Anybody has thoughts on that? Anybody have thoughts on that we're zoomed into the midnight or do we have an alternative to that? Nobody wants to say anything? You're saying we're between midnight and the Sunday law at this point? No, we're before midnight. So just like we know that the Sunday law way mark on Ellen White's line, we can take our whole history, 1989, to the Sunday law and say that that line is to zoom into the Sunday law. Right? So it's, it's a line that precedes the Sunday law. And I'm saying that our present experience is just like that, but we have a way mark in our line that is parallel to the Sunday law. That is, if we believe that the midnight cry follows the Sunday law, or the loud cry follows the Sunday law, then the midnight cry must have followed the Sunday law as well in Millerite history. So the date that symbolizes the Sunday law is this midway date, this midnight date. July 21st, 1844 at Boston, right? That's, that's the way we would have to look at it. So in our line, if we're going to say that we have 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, the Sunday law, paralleling those dates in Millerite history, um, we know that the midnight cry is still future, of course, and that would be the loud cry. So that means the way Mark proceeds the loud cry is the Sunday law. And so just like our movement is a zoom in to the Sunday law on the big line, which we're going to call 
midnight, we're going to zoom into an hour line. The movement is presently zoomed into the, the way mark that is before us called midnight. And that midnight represents the Sunday law in, in that bigger line. The, the line that we have in our in our movement. So, so there is a Sunday law that precedes the Sunday law. And we call it midnight. And, and so we can see then that if we're truly repeating Millerite history and we're looking at these lines correctly, if all of our analysis of the lines of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph are correct, then everything that this movement is presently about is midnight. Overall, this movement is about the Sunday law, but presently, we're, we're, we're trying to understand midnight. And we kept having midnight come and pass. That is, in different lines, we were zooming in, and we would have a midnight and a midnight cry, um, and initially we had placed those Panium or Raphia and Panium, right? So, and, and we can still take those and, and apply them that way. We can still, if we understand which line we're in. And, and so this is a fractal. This is what a fractal is like. You zoom in, you see the same pattern as the big line. So what are the implications of this as far as midnight is concerned? So midnight, so everything that we're doing within our line, we have a midnight in it. We have several midnights in it, depending where, which way mark you're zoomed into. But if we're, if I'm, I'm suggesting that on that line of, of the repeat of history, just below Ellen White's big line, is this way mark midnight, and we haven't reached it yet, but we are experiencing it progressively in our line. That is, we're moving towards this way mark called midnight, and in so doing, we have a reform line to do so. And, and does that make sense to people? Because that's how I understand it. I, do, as, well, I want feedback on that. So can anybody give me feedback on what I just said? I know Rosanna just showed up. Do I have to ask each person individually? Repeat your question, please. So the question has to do with midnight. So I believe that... Um, the line that, that Jeff created, if you want to put it that way, starting in 1989, is a zoom into the Sunday Law Waymark on Ellen White's line, so the big line. And, and, in, and in so doing, we have this, this reform line that is a zoom into a Waymark. And I'm suggesting that we're presently zoomed into the midnight Waymark on Jeff's line, because he has... 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. That, that is a zoom in in and of itself. But I'm suggesting that the movement has been for a while a zoomed into the midnight way mark. That is, that's the way mark we're approaching. And so as we approach a way mark, we also experience a, a reform line that prepares us for that way mark. FFA, and then um, after FFA, what you're saying? Okay, well, I don't know how to label it. I, I would actually call it Jeff's um, line, but yeah. Because, because yeah. Jeff created this line. FFA actually, um, the way that I look at it, because FFA has ended, I mean, they've come to an end. Yeah. Uh, in, in some ways, they're tied to Jeff, but but I see some distinctions. Um, 
regarding those two things, but I don't want to get into that right now. But yes, so Jeff created this big line, 1989 to the Sunday Law, that is a zoom into the Sunday Law. And, and then he took a, I would say it's a zoom in to 9-11 to some degree, when we started looking at this line from November 9th to December 25th. Right. So 1989 or 2019 to um, <clears throat> 2001. And, and so that was a zoom into, in some ways, 9 11. But the movement presently is moving towards midnight. And so I'm saying that on that bigger line of Jeff's, not the big line, Jeff has a midnight way mark. And that we have a reform line that we're presently a part of that is moving us towards midnight. And so in that reform line itself, you're going to have its own midnight and its own midnight cry. And, and one of the best ways we could look at that is we can look at November 9th, 2019 is a parallel to September 11th. Now, this is similar to what Jeff originally um, understood prior to all this time setting stuff, prior to Parminder actually getting involved with the lines. Um, Jeff had this idea that, that there were these separate lines. This was the fractalization um, that uh, Michael had introduced. I believe it was Michael that introduced fractals. And... Um, and this was, this was actually a very powerful idea. The problem was that we didn't fully understand much about the lines yet, that we were, we were missing pieces of information. But what Jeff had kind of done was he would just say, well, this time of the end for one line uh, is going to be a time of the end for another line. And so he introduced uh, the priest Levites and the Nethanim. Now, Parminder took those and then... Um, uh, maybe a better way of looking at it is sort of codified them, but he, he put them in, into a, a structure that really didn't resemble Millerite history. And then Parminder argued that waymarks can't typify other waymarks. So, so he, he sort of had this, these, these lines, which didn't parallel Millerite history, didn't look like the lines that we have already established. And, and try to uh, force this interpretation upon the movement. And that created a lot of confusion. Um, back in 2016, I remember telling somebody that I didn't understand the lines. And, and they thought I was, you know, like, how could I be so ignorant that I couldn't understand it? But it was like somebody saying that the emperor has no clothes. Uh, because they didn't understand the lines either. They just wanted to make it look like they did. Um, and this is one of the persons in the movement who is fairly prominent. Um, so, but I knew that there was something wrong with the lines. So when I said I didn't understand them, I knew that something was wrong, but I just didn't know what it was. And um, so, okay. So Samuel says, I could like you then to harmonize because in Samuel Snow's letters, we are still before the midnight way mark. So I see we are before midnight on the on a big line. That's how I think. And that's how I think, too. So I agree with Samuel there. That if we look at July 18th, it's three days before midnight. And so the line that we needed to understand that we were in, um, you know, we had these this idea of priest, Levites, and Nethanim. But it wasn't really meaningful in the sense we were labeling the lines that, that we were starting to recognize were developing. Um, but I don't think the priest Levites and Nethanim was the correct label. Because we don't have anything like that in Millerite history. What we have is we have Samuel Snow's letters. And Samuel Snow's letters are about July 18th three days before midnight. It's a waymark that's approaching midnight. And these three days 
um, come to us lots of different places in the scriptures, but are especially stand out in uh, the story of Ezra that commences the 2300 days, right? So that's that journey, that year, that 354 days that's presented um, from Ezra 7 to 10, right? So is this reasonable? Does anybody have, because the question is, what does it really mean to us that we're approaching midnight still on this bigger line that Jeff has created? And we don't know when midnight is, but it, it is typical of a Sunday law. And, and, and we could even argue that this pandemic that we've been a part of is connected to that Sunday law progressively. So in, in that way, we would say that we've actually already arrived at midnight. at least the start of it. But it could be the pandemic that we've experienced is also just to zoom into some into our line itself so that we haven't decided. Because what is midnight, midnight going to look like if we're approaching midnight? So I want people to talk. I keep talking, but. Well, it looked like in a Millerite period. How did midnight look like in a Millerite period? Yeah, well, that, that's a good question. So what did it look like? What did Boston look like? Um, because Samuel Snow has been developing this message all through, right? He's been presenting yeah. it in, in the Midnight Cry uh, periodical. Only uh, on April 3rd did he get his first letter published in the signs, but everything else is in the Midnight Cry. Um, so when he gets to Boston, what does that look like? What would that look like to us? What would Boston be like? Well, we don't have a lot of information concerning Midnight, other than what Lochbra tells us about this here back and forth question and answer. Right. So we know that there's the question and answer thing. Um, and we we now know that that Loughborough actually conflates uh, Boston and Exeter because he puts Exeter in July when it's actually Boston that's in July. Right. Correct. And and. And it's most likely that he's riding up on the horse at midnight in Boston, not in Exeter, as it's often given. Because when we look at the actual eyewitness accounts from Exeter, they differ wildly from what Loughborough gives. But, but what we do know is that, that he's giving a message at midnight, but it's not empowered. But he now has a message that he can give, because if we read his his earlier ideas, uh, some of them are quite wrong. I mean, he abandons some of his chronology. So by the time he gets to Boston, he has refined it a bit, still has some some inaccuracies in it because we see it uh, um when it's published even by August 22nd, that it's it's not it's not 100% correct. But but the ideas there, the powerful ideas that that allowed it to become a midnight cry, are there in Boston. Now the other thing is he also declares he's at midnight. Is that a significant detail? You mean in Boston, right? He declares it in Boston? Yeah, in Boston. Okay. It says, now is midnight. I'm giving the midnight cry. You know, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him on the 10th day of the seventh month. I mean, that's Loughborough's 
the count, whether it's word for word or not, I don't know. But the basic idea of how he asks these questions, how long is a day? How long is it till midnight? How long has it been since our disappointment? How long have we been in the tearing time? Right, all of those things become um, uh, an important part of understanding this. Now, like, uh, we have questions too, you know, like right at this point. <laughs> yeah, so questions there's on, questions on things. But I would think once we get to midnight, we should know we're at midnight. Yeah, true. And we should have a message. Right. So, the, so it's a good question. What does midnight look like in Millerite history? Well, it's not the empowerment, right? Because it's going to look a bit different a month later. Right. right. So... basically three weeks later. So he's going to be at Exeter. And when he presents the message at Exeter, it's now going to be empowered. But at Boston, it was just a brief message. So um, my view is that it would have come because it's on a Sunday. It's at the, uh, the tabernacle, the Boston tabernacle. Um, he's going to have ridden up on a horse and arrived while the meeting is going on. Um, would have been, uh, I understand it, asked to have spoken and, and then gives just a brief uh, presentation regarding uh, the time that they're in, that they're in midnight, that the 10th day of the seventh month, where they are then is halfway. Now, he didn't count it out to the day. He doesn't realize, you know, July 21st is exactly halfway between April 19th and October 22. Right? So he doesn't know that, but he knows he's midway, right? So that they've been in, in, in this for three months. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why um, it doesn't make any sense what Lofgrove says, because he puts that at August. And at August, how many months have they been in the tarrying time? Okay, about four. Yeah, four months, right? So they wouldn't be at midnight. He wouldn't say, you know, three months if they've already been in the tearing time four months. So we know that what Loughborough places um, at Exeter actually happened at Boston. Now he does place it in July. So off Loughborough thinks that this is camp meeting in July, that Exeter is in July. So he just gets the two confused. And, and this affects, of course, Adventist understanding of this whole history. So, you know, this movement for the, is the ones who, for the first time, have sorted out uh, Boston and Exeter and put them in their proper context. And, and really, we've only done this recently, that we've understood um, what happened at Boston and what, hap what happens at Boston and what happens at Exeter. Uh, even though we had the dates before, we were still putting Boston events at Exeter because of Loughborough. So, so now we're getting this cleared out. And um, so if we look at this verse here, so Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight. If, is this talking about our message? Is this talking about the message of July 18? So when Samson went down to Gaza, and he, he saw a harlot and went in unto her. We know that morally this is ironic, but we can see that this represents Christ uh, going to his people because what's wrong with this movement at the present time? It's not truly giving a message. It's not giving a message. And also we have the strange wives, right? And are we playing the harlot? Or not playing the harlot, but going down to a harlot. Are we not connected with a harlot? 
Yes. Okay. And and how do we understand that? Because we're not taking it literally. We're connected with those that right now have not wanted to give the message that they were empowered to give. And they're following the wrong rules of study. And they're definitely not wanting to follow Miller's rules. Right. Okay. And so, so Samson goes down to see this harlot and uh, the people of Gaza, they're going to uh, lie in wait for him all night in the gate of the city. And they were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. So they're waiting for their opportunity in the daytime when he comes out from seeing this harlot. But Samson's going to get up in the middle of the night. He's going okay. to wake up. Okay. Before, yep. before we get to the middle of the night. Yeah. Isn't the daylight a symbol? Yes. So in other words, what's being said is they're going to wait until there is greater light. Now, that's also setting aside much of what Mrs. White has written because she always described herself as the lesser light. Yeah. Isn't this also the time will tell? Definitely it's the time will tell. Okay. Right. I don't know. I don't have any disagreement with that whatsoever. Okay. The situation okay. though, it, it's just like saying we need greater light. We're setting aside the spirit of prophecy. We're setting aside the Bible. We need something greater than this. Right, we need to take the light that's been given to us. And Samson is sunlight. Okay. Right. So it's kind of interesting in that context, just the meaning of his name. Because he is light. Can we have light when it is dark? As Christians. We have a lamp, right? God's word. So, so these people who are waiting till morning do. Why? Why can't? Why do they have to wait till morning? Don't they have Miller's ru rules to guide their feet? Because they do not want to accept the light that they have been given. Okay. So Samson is, you know, he's symbolizing here the ten virgins, right? We can, and we know that um, they they need oil for their lamps, right? So some have oil and some do not, right? So so this is an understanding of God's word. So when Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight, he now has a message. Okay, correct. The July 18 letter, the confirming the covenant um, article from the midnight cry of July 18, 1844. Um, we're going to see that that's going to be opened up, if you want to put it that way, at Boston. So, so that's midnight. So Samson's going to lay till midnight and he's going to rise at midnight. Now, here in this illustration, he's going to take the doors of the gate of the city, and we can see that this, this is a two-leaved gate. It's got two posts, and we're saying that this is light that has been given this movement in Colin and Odilio's presentations. But there is a bar that is the bolt, and he's going to take that. He's going to put it upon his shoulders. So this is Christ as well right this is the cross doesn't christ put the cross upon his shoulders and carry it right okay so this is the cross and he's going to place it on the top of the hill right the top of the hill is rosh it has all the numbers that are symbolized as um july 18 2020 
iteration of those, those digits. And then, um, so he's going to place it on the top of the hill, which is before Hebron. And um, so when we look at Hebron, what what is Hebron? Isn't he returning to the old paths? Okay, so it's the place where the ancestors are buried, right? That's isn't it also isn't it also where Abraham coming into this land built an altar? Right. So we're going back to an understanding from the past. We're going back to Miller's rules, right? Right. To the pioneers. And, and so this message is going to be on the top of a hill. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. So this is Samuel Snow at Boston proclaiming that it's midnight and that we're giving the midnight cry. So this is midnight, right? This is the way, Mark, that we're approaching. All right. And so this movement has to be moving towards this. However, you know, we, we have to get there. I mean, it's it's been a difficult journey over the last couple of years. You know, since July 18, 2020, so it's like, um, you know, two and a half years now. And, and this movement has not fulfilled its role. But we know that we are going to. And, and the hindrance has been us ourselves, right? Our lack of preparedness, our lack of character. So that's going to have to change if we're going to give this message. Okay. Any any other thoughts that anybody has about these three verses? Not yet. Okay. So so there's still a lot to understand. Um now, when, when I look up the name Hebron in, um, in Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Gematria, I get the number 266. Um, so what would be the significance of that? I'm not tracking with that yet. Okay, so um, so when we deal with uh, two six six, anybody know what presentation we're in presently of these understanding of lines? Um, well, we're actually, we did number 267 yesterday, so we're in 268 today. Um, so, so we're in that period of time um, in these studies where we can say that we're, we have this symbol of Hebron. Um, and I, I'm trying to 
to figure out where exactly we introduced chapter 16. I don't know if that was yesterday. I mean, I mentioned it in study number 266. I'm just looking at the transcript here. But I think it was in number 267 that we actually first went to 16 verse 1. If I remember correctly. Was it yesterday that we first looked at chapter 16, verse 1, or did we do that? I think yesterday briefly looked at what I think. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm um, here. Yeah. So we finished off chapter 15 on Sunday, and then presentation number 266. And so then in presentation 267, we're going to look at this 16 verse 1, if, if I'm remembering this correctly. So 16 verse 1, we say, is the wave sheaf offering. We, we've looked at these verses starting yesterday. So we can say that this is about a chiasm the center of a chiasm, which we would call midnight. And, and in some ways, we've, we've entered into midnight, but we're still not, we haven't completed this midnight way mark. Does that seem fair? And I'm saying that this is the midnight of... Jeff's line. I mean, we're definitely to July 18, right? To the confirming the covenant. But we have this period of three days to July 21st. Okay, so I know it's a lot of things to think about. Um, okay, well let's let's move on here into Judges um, sixteen one. Okay, so uh, yesterday was sixteen one. That's right. So yesterday was January sixteenth, and on January sixteenth we introduced the sixteenth day of the first month. Is that significant? You're saying 16th day of the first month on the biblical calendar? Yeah, we introduced the the wave sheaf offering. That's okay. that's what we saw yesterday when we went to Judges 16 verse one. We said, well, this is the wave sheaf offering. This is uh, symbolically Collins' presentation. No, right? because he's the 49 days going to to Odilios. Yeah, isn't there another symbol that we can apply there? Yes. So just like with 158, yep. we can go to 161. So that's going to be uh, when they, they make the league. The league goes into effect in 158 BC, but there's three years there between the, the making the league and it, it going into effect. It's being implemented, right? Well, the, the 161 is the making the league. The 158 is the implementation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we, we've taken note of that before, that that three years represents the three days. But that's a league that they should not have entered into. Right. We understand that. Yeah, so it's a league they should not have entered into. And, and a league is a covenant, isn't it? Agreed. Right. And we know that Confirming the covenant is the July 18 article in 1844. And, and so we have two covenants. We have a true and a counterfeit. Right? The, 
the two twenty the two twelve sixties from seven twenty three BC to five thirty eight AD and five thirty eight AD to seventeen ninety eight. That's the Satanic covenant. That's the covenant of northern Israel. Right? The counterfeit there, the thirty, the thirty years, the center of that chiasm. The Sunday law is the center of that as well, connected to it, 508 to 538. Right? So we have those symbols of the Sunday law. We have 30 years. Does 30 years represent three days? It can. Yeah. So, so we have all of these symbols. 30 years also set, represents three years. Right? So we have three years, three days, 30 days, 30 years, all of these things. They all have threes. And they all come prior to the center of a chiasm. Okay. So we got the 161. We have it's the 16th day of the first month. So January 16th, we introduced that. So that was yesterday. It was after, it was study number 267, which was the day after study number 266. Hebron is 266. So it's before 267. Here it says before Hebron, but maybe we go in reverse. But anyway, we have all of these symbols, and we, we know we have the wave sheaf offering, and that's 50 days before Pentecost. Odilio's study is the two loaves, which is on Pentecost. That's chapter 15 at the beginning, right, with the 300 foxes. And now in this story, we have 161 being introduced. And that's going to be um, Colin's presentation. So in some ways, we're going in reverse here. <clears throat> And we have these three verses for this story representing the three days. And, and since it's ironically moral, morally ironic, um, we can take this and go backwards. That is, we can go from Hebron, which is study 266, and then after 266, we work our way up to the January 16th, but there's lots of symbols here. And I, I don't think we can just, you know, dismiss this. So I, I understand what you're saying, looking at the 161. Now, when we look at the next part of the story of Delilah, so we're just going to start on this. So it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, we know Delilah means uh, it's, it's a word that um, is 1807 in the Hebrew, which means languishing. Um, but it also is related to the word night. Not, not necessarily by definition, but just by the first part of, um, or not the first part, but the Lila part, right? So, Lila means night. Delilah is, is her name, languishing. Or feeble. <clears throat> okay, so um, now we have Sorek, which we never really addressed, just means a vine. So when it says he came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of the vine, whose name was Feeble. What would this mean? Symbolically, what, what are we looking at? Because this is Christ, right? So if we just look at first as Christ. Does Christ come to save someone that's feeble?
Samson's interested in all these women, and these women represent churches, right? Isn't this regarding an enfeebled church? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Christ is going to become, or Samson's going to become enfeebled himself, is he not? In this story? Agreed. So Christ came and take upon himself our sins. He died for us. So, so on that level, we could look at this story. But we know also that this applies to us. And that Samson represents a message. Represents light that comes to us. And, it's, and we're enfeebled. Now it says, the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Now we address these 1,100 pieces of silver. Um, we know that this is also... Uh, in the next chapter as well, right? So we're, we're going to look at that again. Right. And Delilah said unto Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherein thou, wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, if they bind me with seven green withs, that's bowstrings, that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man, right? So we can see, of course, here these symbols, the seven um, bowstrings. And then the lords of the Philistines brought up her seven green widths, with which, which, widths which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. And they were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he break the widths as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth uh, the fire. So his strength was not known. Yeah, so he goes from Gaza, which means strength, to Delilah, which is feeble. That's a good point there. Um. So we're going to look at this story. So remember, we, we need to review uh, what we had studied before. Because there was lots in this, this study. Um, but you're going to see this seven showing up. So it's going to be these seven widths or bowstrings. Um, the seven locks of his head. Right? Right? And what was the other one? Um, just new ropes. There isn't going to be uh, mentioned anything about the number of them. Um, but they, they're going to be these three times, right? But there's, there's going to be a fourth. So that's a three-one combination. So there's lots of symbols that we're going to have to look at again. Um, so I'm, di I'm just going to read this through here. So I'm going to go... Uh, from verse 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. How, how many lords of the Philistines are there? I believe that there are five main cities of the Philistines, so wouldn't there be five lords? Yeah, that's, that's the way that I understand it. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green widths that were never dried, then shall I be weak. And B is another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green widths, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. 
Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the withs, as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth the fire. So his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait, abiding in the chamber, and he brake them from off his arms like a thread. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep, awaked out of his sleep, and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thy heart, thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been an Azurite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Albeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Okay, so we won't go to the next part here. Now, we know that we had looked at this before. Um, and we know that there is these, um, these symbols that we can see in these bowstrings, in the rope, in uh, the weaving loom, um, and also in the number seven, the seven locks the seven bowstrings. So how did we apply this when we looked at this last time? Does anybody remember how we applied this story? What are these three and this fourth? So if we see a three one combination, what do we what, what do we normally say about it? Haven't we usually applied that with the messages of Revelation fourteen and eighteen? Yeah. So that's how we we normally look at it, and can we see it? in this way you mean in this chapter yeah in this chapter can we see it that it's applying that these are the three angels messages and the fourth we should be able to see it okay. 
Now, we're, we're taking this, of course, in our history. But why, why are these, um, and, and because the problem here has to do with this moral irony um, of Samson. Um, so are these tests Certainly. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I'm not sure exactly how we can take them. I mean, we could take them as uh, the way marks in our line. So, I mean, we could say the first one's November 9th, 2019. The second one, because that's where, you know, we're, we're going to connect November 9th to uh, September 11th, right? So we, we, we could take these three and do it in that way. So we could then take July 18th, and then we would take December 25th, and then we'd have to take where the fourth one is. So that's one way we could do it. We could stretch it out a bit further, and we could start at 9-11, and then look at the history of this movement and try to apply these tests in that way. But we would primarily deal with the symbols themselves. So when we look at the narrative of the story, um, it's morally ironic. But when we look at the symbols themselves, we don't flip them on their heads. And so in, in studying this and trying to place this on a line, because that's what we're trying to do right now, we need to recognize the symbols that are there. And so in each one of these, first, you're going to have this story about the 1,100 pieces of silver, right? And when we did um, a study on this, um, uh, where is this here? Um, so that's going to be Judges 17 that you're going to have this 1,100 shekels of silver. It's the same expression that are going to be connected with this story that we looked at in Judges. And this is a story that precedes this history by quite a bit, because this is this last part of the book of Judges is actually the history uh, just after Joshua's death. But in this story, you're going to have 1,100 pieces of silver as well that are mentioned. And so there's no way that we could look at the 1,100 pieces of silver in chapter 16 and ignore their connection to chapter 17. Right? It's almost as if Judges is opened and closed regarding this 1,100 pieces of silver. Yeah, and we had some ideas about that, um, but we're going to examine those again, right? So those, those are things we're going to have to look at and try to decide what that means symbolically. We, we took it as time. So I, I think that's a valid way of looking at it but because we get that from our other places in scripture, such as Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to see that there's 200 shekels of silver that are going to be divided out of that, that are going to be used to make a graven image and a molten image, right, in that story. So I don't, I don't think we can ignore that story. So we're going to have to come back to that story again in addressing that, these 1,100 pieces of silver and what they mean. Now, the question that we had before was, well, if there's five lords of the Philistines, um, are we going to be looking at uh, five times 11, so 5,500 pieces of silver? Or is it that altogether they're going to give that much silver? Right. So I don't know. Um, can't remember how we all decided on that, what was done. I, I, I think I took the position it was just 1,100 pieces of, of silver. But uh, So if, it's, if it was just... 
a total of 1,100 pieces of silver. Then each of the lords of the Philistines are giving 220 pieces of silver each. Right. right. If they're giving 1,100 pieces each, that's 5,500. Yeah, exactly. So um, so I think we took the, the position that they were each giving 220 pieces of silver. So if, if I remember correctly. And, and in chapter 17, um, they're going to take 200 of the shekels or pieces of silver to make this molten image. So that's a little bit less than 220. But uh, there's a symbolism there in the number two. And then um, as far as time is concerned, it's just a little over three years. So if you have 1,100 days, it's actually three years and four and a quarter days. 1,100 days is just a little bit over three years on, on a solar calendar. Uh, we could also you know, look at it on a biblical calendar, but just we know that if whatever date, if we're going to start on a date and you're going to count uh, 1,100 days, you're going to count three years plus four days. So we'll see if that applies anywhere. And... Um, There's a number of different symbols that uh, that I, I don't think we completely addressed because we weren't putting it on a line yet, but there are symbols here that can help us uh, put these things on a line, um, which we've now you know come to understand like verse numbers and so, so forth. So we're going to have to look at the 1,100 pieces of silver. We're going to look at each of these tests and try to understand what's being represented by them. And, and even Judges 16, verse 6. Um, so this is FFA backwards. So it is if we take the letter 6 representing F and 1 representing A. And this was a point that was brought out by um, Captain Caleb in connection with uh, things, and other people have taken this up. But I think that they misapplied how to use this symbol. It's a correct symbol. Uh, so 661 is FFA, 166 is AFF. Um, but I think that this, this verse here is telling. And... Um, we also have 1622, but we can take the 622 as a symbol of FFA as well. And then here we just have this, this one here. So we can take parts of these numbers. Um, and, and even the 1618, the Fibonacci sequence, I think is significant. The golden ratio, yeah. And um, yeah, so there's going to be lots here in this that we're going to have to bring back to our memory and lots that we're going to notice that we didn't notice before. But we, we have to figure out where this fits on a line, starting at verse 4. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer?
just a lot for us to consider right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just going to say that Judges 16, 6 reminds me of Jeremiah 6, 16 about returning to the old paths. There is where our strength lies. And that was the question that Samson was asked. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, yeah, there's lots of different symbols here that we're going to, we're going to look at. Okay. Let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we've had here this morning. We know that we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work ahead of us in study and prayer in our personal lives. We know, Lord, that you are seeking to bring this movement together, and we pray uh, for it. We see the signs that, that you have been working upon our hearts and upon the hearts of others. And we just pray, Lord, that as many people as possible uh, can come to that upper room and experience um, unity with you and with each other. Forgive us for our sins, our thoughts, our attitudes. Help us, Lord, to trust in you and help us to reflect your character in all things. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.